Hi team. In this lesson, we're going to learn about measuring returns for a private equity transaction because the ultimate measure of investment success in private equity is the return achieved. To get an idea of what the expected rate of return might be, we will use our projection to measure both the implied internal rate of return or IRR and multiple of invested capital or MOIC. The challenge is that these measures rely heavily on quite a few assumptions that can be difficult to predict at the time of acquisition. And compounding this challenge is the fact that any calculation of expected return generally involves the use of an assumed EBITDA exit multiple, which is perhaps the most single-handedly influential and difficult to predict variable in all of private equity investing. So before we dive into the worksheet, we will first address this metric. Now for a metric that's so pervasive, it's amazing how much some great investors really hate it. The brilliant Charlie Munger on the topic of EBITDA has the following to say. I think you'd understand any presentation using the word EBITDA if every time you saw that word, you just substituted the phrase bullshit earnings. But it has its purposes and it's an industry standard. EBITDA multiples quickly became the primary metric used by investors to evaluate, describe, and benchmark leveraged buyout transactions in the 1980s, and it retains that title to this day. So what is an EBITDA multiple? An EBITDA multiple is, very simply, a company's enterprise value divided by its EBITDA. Conversely, enterprise value can be calculated by multiplying EBITDA by the EBITDA multiple. This metric has long been used as a shorthand approach to a company's valuation, and you will frequently hear individual deals or entire industries referred to as an X times deal or an X times industry, with X being a multiple of EBITDA. By way of example, a SaaS-based business with a particularly sticky business model would command a higher EBITDA multiple on average than a business that has to purchase and replace expensive equipment frequently. The potential to scale and the difference in capital intensity between the two business models would largely contribute to that. As a quick way to think through this logic, the closer EBITDA is to actual cash flow on a consistent basis, and the more predictable it is for an industry or a company, the higher the multiple. So back to our SaaS example, if an industry doesn't require much in the way of capital expenditures, and you think about depreciation as a proxy for capital expenditures, then it follows that the industry would command a higher multiple when compared to one that does require significant capex on an annual basis. Now, going back to our projection, in most LBO models, cash flows and EBITDA growth are projected for five years with an EBITDA multiple used to estimate enterprise value in the exit year. The underlying assumption is that the business is sold in the final year. In most instances, and certainly for most growing and healthy businesses, this sale generates the lion's share of the proceeds to be distributed to investors. For this reason, it's generally frowned upon to use an exit multiple of EBITDA larger than the multiple paid on entry, especially if you cannot articulate why the investment is deserving of so-called multiple expansion. I distinctly recall the first time I tried this in a model. Young and inexperienced, I bumped up the multiple and submitted the model for review. One of the MDs definitely yelled at me some, or a lot, and made it known that what I had submitted was, well, just terrible. As an aside, I was always the taller one because I am 6'6", and even though it was early in my career, I was already fully grown. But because the use of a higher exit multiple is one of the easiest ways to inflate returns, and because multiples on private equity deals have generally been expanding over the past decade, for reasons we'll expand on shortly, it can be very tempting to bump it up at exit. Now, I've been thinking for years that multiples are high only to watch them continue rising. Private equity multiple expansion has been supported by persistently declining interest rates, increasing competition for transactions, record levels of dry powder, which is to say the amount of capital devoted to the space and waiting to be deployed, and available financing for acquisitions. Collectively, these variables have caused the entire capital stack, measured as a multiple of EBITDA, to expand. Per McKinsey & Company, the amount of leverage employed in U.S. buyouts is at an elevated level today compared to much of the past two decades. The two-year trailing average stands at seven times EBITDA, and that compares with 6.4 times in 2007, just prior to the Great Recession, which, in this context, is an alarming period to be replicating or even exceeding. The Global Private Equity Report, released by Bain & Company, contains an infographic demonstrating an aggressive reversal in leverage multiples from 2007 to 2009 in the depths of the financial crisis, which has been exceeded by the recovery that has spanned up to the present day. 
As leverage multiples have increased, so too have purchase price multiples. With the two-year trailing average multiple reaching a record 12.8 times EBITDA in 2020 compared with 9.4 times in 2007. And then consider that more than two-thirds of all U.S. buyout deals have had EBITDA multiples greater than 11 times. And then compare that to the history. It's pretty wild. This information might make it tempting to underwrite an aggressive exit multiple, certainly if you assume recent trends continue. The question that any intelligent investor needs to ask, though, is whether this change is secular or cyclical. Late in a bull market, it's not uncommon for investors to begin asking themselves if the standard of value has been permanently raised. Citing OG value investor Benjamin Graham, Jim Grant compares peak multiples in the late 1920s to those of today. From his newsletter dated April 16, 2021, Graham reminded his readers that such fantastic reasoning actually led to price-to-earnings ratios of 50 and more. This generation does him one better. Bloomberg counts 253 American companies with price-to-sales ratios of 50 and higher. Now, at some point, history often repeats itself, especially in financial markets, where the high-flying multiples of the 1920s were followed by the terrible crash of the Great Depression. But persistently strong multiples and an accommodating Federal Reserve make it difficult to get too worked up, at least in the near term. That said, as investors, it's important to make certain we're not lulled to sleep. And since we are building with a conservative bias, it's best to use the same entry multiple for our exit, at least as a starting point. As a final consideration, a primary driving force behind this multiple expansion has been the fact that interest rates are at all-time lows. For all of history, they've never been lower and we've hit a floor unless we start to explore negative rates. What that means is that one of the primary driving factors supporting multiple expansion is out. So where do we go from here? I certainly find it very interesting. In the next segment, we'll look at building this worksheet in Excel, but otherwise, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.